Okay, Genesis chapter 30, here we go. And when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, uh, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, give me children or else I die. So that's self-explanatory. Rachel, she sees uh, that there's no children she was able to give birth for her husband Jacob, so she envies her sister Leah. And then she says to Jacob, hey, you give me children or I'm going to die. Now remember, I'm, my goal is to explain each and every word from the verse. Because people say they don't understand the verses that they're reading in the King James Bible. That's false. It's just that you don't have a, the common sense gist of it yet. So that's why we are doing this verse by verse Bible study. That's why coming to church is important. So that if you come to a Bible believing church, then you can get the right Bible believing interpretation. Nowadays, uh, churches don't do that. They just do little ditty devotionals, skim through, and that's it. And you're not growing in Bible knowledge. So in this class, what you're going to see me doing is explaining every single word. And don't take that as repetitive or machinery. See if every explanation that I say matches with every word in the verse. If you're King James Bible believers, then by golly, you better look up each and every word and see if it matches, all right? All right. So notice right here that verse 2, and Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, am I in God's stead? So Jacob's anger was kindled up. So that's like a fire being kindled, right? Being stirred up. So his anger is burning like a fire against his wife, Rachel. And he says to her, am I in God's place? Why? Who hath withheld from thee the fruit of the womb? Now that's very important. There are some important markers about Rachel that we're going to be covering that I want you to mark down, especially for you women. You're going to learn a lot from Rachel's life. So this is one of those uh, nuggets on Bible studies concerning women that I want you to pay attention to. So the first clue, the first nugget that I want you to take note of is in God's place who prevented uh, Rachel from giving birth to children within her womb. That's why it's called fruit of the womb. Fruit is referring to the seed, babies being born within the womb. And she said, Behold, my maid Bilhah, go in unto her, and she shall bear upon my knees. Rachel responds, hey, look. So remember the word behold is commonly used throughout the book of Genesis as, um, as that word to, hey, pay attention to this part, right? Or hey, look. Right. So she's saying, here's my maid Bilhah. You go in unto her, so you sleep with her so that she can bring forth children for me that I may also have children by her. That's the idea. She shall bear upon my knees is meaning that's how people give birth to children. Go to Exodus 1. Exodus 1. Uh, Bible commentators, they'll say that's a, mis that's a wrong translation from the King James Bible. They have no idea what they're talking about. That's very common. If you go to the Rosicrucian Egyptian Museum, they even have this room where... Uh, women, that they would have the, what they call birthing stools or these bricks. And what the women would do that time is put their knees on these bricks and uh, sit down like that so that they can give birth to children that way. So that was common that time. So that's what it means, give birth upon my knees. See that? So notice that the Bible's way ahead. It mentioned that in Egypt in Exodus chapter 1. Exodus 1 verse 16. And he said, when you do the office of a what? Midwife to the Hebrew women. So these are women helping other women give birth to children. And see them upon the stools, if it be a son. See that? All right, go back to Genesis again. Genesis 30 again. Verse 4. And she gave him Bilhah, her handmaid to wife, and Jacob went in unto her. Self-explanatory, Rachel gives Bilhah her own handmaid, for to be Jacob's wife, and Jacob, uh, flesh joining flesh, he slept with her, and Bilhah conceived and bare Jacob a son. Self-explanatory, Bilhah was able to conceive a child, and she gave birth to a son for Jacob. And Rachel said, God hath judged me, and hath also heard my voice, and hath given me a son. Rachel responds out of this scenario that God judged 
in my place. Because remember, she's on, in a competition with Leah. So she thinks God is on her side. God is judging for her place. God heard my voice, and that's why he gave me a son. Therefore called she his name Dan. But believe it or not, Dan would be the tribe that's very likely to be the Antichrist. Now, remember, each tribe is going to match each birthstone according uh, to the book of, I, either it was Leviticus or Numbers that I showed you last time, and then it goes by the apostle ranking and then by the month, okay? By this month, if we depended upon the stones and the apostles in Revelation chapter 21, as I've explained to you last time, or by the book of Exodus, uh, I think it was Exodus actually, in the book of Exodus, where the stone matches their birth, if it goes that way, then that's how you can see the sequence. So I'm not going to explain all of that. I already explained that to you last time. If some of you don't know about that, just watch my previous video and, I'll ex and you'll see the explanation more slow and more clear. But anyway, continuing on from where we last left off, Dan means judge, okay? And then his stone would match sapphire or emerald. And then the apostle could be Andrew or Bar Bartholomew. If it's either the uh, sapphire or emerald, either or, the Gentile month would be May, the Jewish month would be July to August. Now, Dan, why would he be the candidate for the Antichrist? Go to Genesis 49, Genesis 49. Now, I cannot say 100% the Antichrist will come from the tribe of Dan, but if you want to find the best candidate in the Bible from which Jewish tribe he'll come from, the best Jewish tribe, hands down, unless anybody else brings up a different tribe, which I haven't heard, is Dan. So first things first is that Satan is known to be a serpent, right? People talk about the serpent seed. They also talk about bloodlines of the Illuminati or whatnot. If all of that's connected together, or if there is such a thing as lizard men today, and the Antichrist can come from that Nephilim if they are around today, then think about this. Then it would have to associate itself with the serpent's DNA, serpent's bloodline, serpent's seed. Well, Dan is likened to that in Genesis 49, 16. Dan shall judge his people, right? His name is judge. But notice as a judge, verse 17, Dan shall be a serpent, by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse heel so that his rider shall fall backward. Have you ever wondered why Satan might think he still has a chance against Jesus Christ at Armageddon? Because maybe he is that serpent where he can attack the horse rider and the horse can fall backwards. Okay, go to Judges 19. Judges 19. Judges 19. Another clue is if you're going to think about the Antichrist religion, which is a Babylonian religion. It is a Babylonian religion that goes to Roman Catholicism. You know where that all came from, for some of you who didn't know? If you read Hislop's work and other people who trace Catholicism to Babylonian roots, it came from that uh, Phoenician area. But that Phoenician area, the northernmost tribe of Israel that's connectly closest to that, that spread that Babylonian religion, is Dan. It's Dan. So go to Judges 18, excuse me, Judges 18. Look at verse 30, verse 30. And the children of Dan set up the graven image. And Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests, kind of like Roman Catholic priests, with graven images, right? To the Ohu tribe of Dan, until the day of the captivity of the land. And they set them, up Milka's, uh, set them up Micah's graven image, which he made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. So all the way to the end of the nation of Israel. Dan stuck true to that Babylonian religion all the way. Go to Revelation 11. Revelation 11. Which might explain why in the tribulation... When God restores or uses, Revelation 7, excuse me, Revelation 7, that when God restores the 12 tribes of Israel in the tribulation, guess which tribe is not restored? Dan, in the tribulation. 
It shows that the tribe of Dan is going to be on the bad guy side. So go to Revelation chapter 7. Chapter 7. And then verse 4. Verse 4. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of Israel. See that? Now look at verse 5. No Dan. Verse 6. No Dan. Verse 7. No Dan. Verse 8. No Dan. And that number's in total 12 tribes. All right, go back. Go back. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 30. So Dan's tribe is very likely to be the candidate from which the Antichrist bloodline will come along if he is serpent seed and Nephilim. All right, go to Genesis chapter 30. And then we'll read verse, we left off at verse... 7, 7. And Bilhah, Rachel's maid, conceived again and bare Jacob a second son. Now Bilhah, Rachel's maid, is with child again. She gives birth to Jacob another son. Rachel said, with great wrestlings have I wrestled with my sister and I have prevailed. And she called his name Naphtali. So Rachel responds uh, to this birth of the second son. I have wrestled with my sister with a great wrestling, sparring match, competition, and I won. So I'm going to name him Naphtali. So Naphtali is named wrestling. He would match the diamond. The apostle would be Bartholomew or Andrew. And then the month would be either June for Gentile or August to September for a Jew. Now, remember, like I told you before, all this, you're going to have to make the table chart yourself. It's either going to match with the, the sequence, how you're going to have to do it is either by the foundations of New Jerusalem with those uh, stones in order that's supposed to lay uh, the foundation or names of 12 apostles, which 12 tribes would match up in uh, Revelation 21. Or you're going to have to go by the birth or the sequence of Exodus, where it names the tribes according to their birth. So either or, and then you're going to have to match the months all with that, with those numbered rankings. So that's why I put a lot of ors, and a lot of it is just uh, shaky. So you have to uh, clarify it yourselves and then organize it yourselves. But like Dr. Ruckman said, it's a pain in the neck that not even Einstein could conjure it up. So... You're going to have to organize it yourselves. This is the, just a rough draft. And I, when I mean rough, I mean rough, okay? That's a rough draft, okay? When Leah, saw, uh, when Leah saw that she had left bearing, verse 9, she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her Jacob to wife. Oh, Leah is going to join the competition because she left bearing. So in other words, uh, she's not uh, continuing her bringing forth of children. She left off on that. So then she takes her handmaid Zilpah and gives her to wife for Jacob. So Jacob marries her and then verse 10, and Zilpah, Leah's maid, bear Jacob a son. And Leah said, a troop cometh. And she called his name Gad. So Zilpah, who is Leah's maid, was able to give birth to a son for Jacob. And Leah responds to that, hey, an army's coming for you. <laughs> So she's, uh, she's battling with her sister Rachel. That's why she calls the baby's name Gad. So Gad is troop. And then he could probably match, uh, I don't know how you pronounce this, Ligure or Ligure, whatever, Jacinth or the Oval. So either or in all of these three. The apostle is not mentioned by Dr. Ruckman. The month could be November if it's Gentile, if it's, going to buy, if it's going by a Jewish month, could be September to October. Let's continue reading on. Verse 12, And Zilpah, Leah's maid, bare Jacob a second son. And Leah said, Happy am I, for the daughters will call me blessed. And she called his name Asher. So Zilpah, Leah's maid, gives birth to another son for Jacob. And then Leah responds to that, I am so happy. All the women around me are going to call me blessed. So she calls his name Asher, which means blessed. And Reuben went in the days of wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field. 
and brought them unto his mother Leah. So during the time of harvesting wheat, Reuben, if you recall, he's the eldest son and he's connected to Leah. Okay, so Reuben, he found mandrakes in the field during that time of the wheat harvest. And then he gives it to his mother Leah. Now, look at Rachel. Then Rachel said to Leah, give me, I pray thee, of thy son's mandrakes. So Rachel pleads to her sister Leah to give her uh, the mandrakes that her son was able to gather. So that's what I pray thee mean. It means to urge. Remember what pray means. It's to beg, to urge. And she said unto her, Leah responds to Rachel, Is it a small matter that thou hast taken away my husband? That thou hast taken my husband? And wouldst thou take away my son's mandrakes also? So that's self-explanatory. Is, is it a small thing to you? It's not a big deal to you, right? That you took away my husband. Now you're going to take away my son's mandrakes as well? And Rachel said, Therefore he shall lie with thee tonight for thy son's mandrakes. Rachel makes a deal with Leah. She says, okay, hence, that's why, that's why therefore means obviously, what I'm going to do is uh, my husband can be with you tonight in exchange for your son's mandrakes if you were to give it to me. Now, Rachel's very desperate for this. The reason why is the cultures during that time, and a lot of it was pagan, and they believed that it was used as a fertility drug. Because if you pull up the mandrake by the root, it'll look like a person. But quite often, if you look up mandrakes, a lot of Wiccas, uh, Wiccans use that. Now notice how Rachel relies on this. There's a lot of gleaning you're going to dig up on Rachel. But I'll come to that as soon as I finish Rachel's story. That way you women can learn something from this, okay? Rachel is a typical type of a Christian woman who gets, met, who gets uh, sucked in by the world, who gets sucked in by fleshly feminine instincts, okay? So I'm going to show you a lot of gleanings from that later. So that's the reason why she's so desperate she wants a mandrake, because remember, Rachel was not giving birth to children. So she thought that by having this uh, mandrake, it could help her to become more fertile. Verse 16, And Jacob came out of the field in the evening, and Leah went out to meet him and said, oh, oh, Jacob's in for a surprise. Jacob just comes out, out of the field in the evening, and then Leah goes out to meet him and then says to him, Thou must come in unto me, for surely I have hired thee with my son's mandrakes. Oh, man, Jacob is surely reaping what he sowed. Rachel sells him out. Okay. Man, can you imagine that? That's, that's got to be an awful feeling, man. Rachel sells him out so that Jacob has to sleep with uh, Leah as a result. Imagine, man, your wife doing that to you. That's got to be a horrible feeling. So Leah says to Jacob, hey, you have to uh, come with me to bed tonight because for as a certainty, I bought you, I hired you for my son's mandrakes. And he lay with her that night. So that's self-explanatory. Verse 17, And God hearkened unto Leah, and she conceived and bare Jacob the fifth son. So God hears Leah. Now remember why God hears Leah. Now it doesn't say that God hears Rachel. Rachel only claims that God hears her. But God hears Leah. Why? Because if you recall back at chapter 29, and then verse 31 through 32, Leah was in grief. And usually God hears women's grief or grievances. And because of that, the Lord can answer to that and meet them. Rachel was not in grief. She needed to be in grief to learn something. But that's a clue right there for you women, okay? She was very beautiful. She was well favored by people. She needed to be humble. Okay, let's go back to Genesis chapter 30. Uh, let's see right here, uh, verse 17. So God hears Leah again, and then so Leah is with child again and gives birth to a fifth son to Jacob in verse 17. And Leah said, God hath given me my hire because I have given my maiden to my husband. So even though that's not spiritually right, uh, God nevertheless gives her a child. 
So Leah says out of this that from what I hired, you know, that night with her husband, God gave me a child because I gave my maid uh, to my husband. So this is pretty mean, okay? It could mean, uh, it's likely to mean that she meant her handmaid Zilpah that she gave to her husband. But if it's by following the context my hire, she called her sister her maiden, which is pretty a mean thing to say, okay? Uh, and then she calls his name Issachar as a result, which means hire. Man, imagine. How was, why was I named such, Mommy? Well, your name because, you know, <laughs> because uh, the husband was uh, hired for that night for mandrakes. So his name means a uh, higher reward. Now, I didn't really cover Asher, I think. I'm sorry. But Asher means happy and blessed, right? So then his stone would go with a gate, but it does not match the sardonyx. So, uh, I mean, it's, so we don't know what's going on right here. It doesn't match with the stones right here with Exodus and uh, Revelation. So that one you'll have to figure out. Dr. Upman doesn't mention the apostle or disciple. He says the Gentile month could be August or the Jewish month could be October, November. For Issachar, he could be Amethyst or maybe Sapphire, even though Sapphire was mentioned here, which is why it could be the Emerald. So it's confusing. So we don't know. Not mentioned here. Gentile month could be September or December. The Jewish month could be November to December or February to March. Continuing on. And Leah conceived again and bare Jacob the sixth son. Man, she just keeps giving birth to children. So Leah, she's with child again, gives birth a sixth son to Jacob. At verse 20, and Leah said, God hath endued me with a good dowry. So Le Leah answers that God gifted her, that's what endued me, with a good dowry. So what, what does she mean by that? A good dowry meaning what uh, women gives to their husband when they get married. So in their marriage, as they get married together, so meaning flesh joining flesh together, then there should be a gift that a woman or an inheritance or something that they have that they give to their husbands. So which is a sad thing, meaning that Leah sees that her relationship with Jacob all that time was not really an official marriage together or flesh joining flesh. So Leah, you can see she lived a miserable life, which is why God gifted her with children. So she thinks that out of all this, this is finally an official marriage where Jacob could recognize her as a uh, good wife. If you keep reading, she explains that. Now will my husband dwell with me. See, told you so. It matches that. So she sees that now with the sixth child, her husband, uh, Jacob, will live together with her. So they must have been in separate bedrooms or separate tents or hardly hung around with each other. So that's pretty sad. Because I have borne him six sons, and she called his name Zebulun, because she gave birth to six sons, uh, the husband, Jacob, will finally recognize this as an official marriage and be with her. So she calls his name Zebulun, which means dwelling, dwelling. His, name, uh, his stone would match the barrel. Nothing mentioned here about the apostle disciple. Gentile month could be August or October. Or it could be the Jewish month, October to November, or December to January, either or. Let's see, continuing on. If you're someone watching us online, you got one big advantage. This picture will be shown by the end of the video, and you can take a big shot. It's a pain in the neck to write all this down. So, Verse 21, and afterwards, she bare a daughter and called her name Dina. So after giving birth to six sons... She gives birth to a daughter. All this time, Jacob had boys. So you can see God's hand behind the scenes where he, even though Jacob's reaping what he's sown, at the same time, God is fulfilling his promise that out of Jacob's line, he'd have so many uh, people coming out of his seed. So you need men for that. So the Lord really 
fulfilled his promise while making sure Jacob reaped what he sown. So if there's one thing you know about God is he will fulfill his promise to the Jews, but at the same time, he knows how to make them reap what they sow. Okay? He can do the same thing with his uh, saved children, the Christians. So finally, a daughter is born after all this, and then she calls the daughter's name Dina. Now we look at verse 22. 22. And God remembered Rachel and hearkened to her and opened her womb. Okay, God remembers Rachel. He never, uh, he, he finally puts her to mind. He didn't forget her. He hears her and then opens her womb. Why? There is only one passage that matches up with that explanation. So remember these words in verse 22 and look at 1 Samuel 1. 1 Samuel 1. It is the exact same case and the exact same wording is used. All right, women, get ready for a good lesson here. You ready for some preaching? Here we go. All right. All right, am I cut off or no? Okay, right here? Okay, then. I wasn't cut off when I was here that time, right? Okay, then. Please keep an eye on that. All right, 1 Samuel chapter 1, 1 Samuel chapter 1. Now look at this here, and then notice in verse uh, 6, okay, verse 5, verse 5. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb, and her adversary also provoked her sore. For to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. Now, isn't that interesting? God shuts up the womb. Doesn't that match well with Rachel's case? Yeah, okay. And doesn't it match with Rachel's case again? Did it catch all the wording right here? Okay, then. This side too, right? Okay. Notice that Hannah is favored more than the other wife. That matches with Jacob's uh, story with Leah and Rachel, right? Same thing. Favoritism of one wife against the other. This all matches. So notice that the Lord, see, he understands uh, women's pain, even though the culture of that time is unfair for women. But God, he hears women's uh, cries and pains, and then he knows what gives them joy is more children. So he'll take care of the women who are more despised that time during that time of polygamy, during that time of culture. So God, he always takes care of them. Now look at verse, uh, look at verse 10. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. She said in verse 11, look at this. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and what? Remember me. That matches with Genesis. God remembered Rachel. So Hannah says, remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man child. Then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. So she makes a vow to the Lord. She dedicates uh, herself to the Lord and prays to him. Notice right here, in verse, let's see, 19. The last part of verse 19, Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the what? Lord remembered her. Okay, so the Lord remembers her. Now notice again at verse, let's see. I'm trying to find that wording here. I think I'll have to stop right here. So I'm going to uh, just point out these parts. So notice right here that God, he's able to remember Hannah, and then he obviously hears her prayer, right? So if you go back to Genesis 30, if you go back to Genesis 30, notice it says that uh, verse 22 God hearkened to Rachel, right? How can God hear Rachel unless she prays it? 
It's the same thing with Hannah. Now, Rachel said that God heard her before. That's why she named the child Dan. But as you can see, the fruit from Dan's line doesn't look pretty good. It's the same thing like Eve. I've gotten a man from the Lord, right, when Cain was born? So it shows right here Rachel did not really pray. She didn't pray at the beginning. Why? Because then God would have remembered. In verse 22, God remembers, God hears, which matches with Hannah's prayer. Hannah says, remember me. And then when she prays, God hears her. That can only happen if she gave her petition to the Lord. It shows that Rachel never did that. Another thing right here is verse 23. The clue is, and she conceived and bare a son and said, God hath taken away my reproach. So uh, Rachel, she is able to uh, conceive a child and then she gives birth to a son and she says, God took away my reproach. See, God takes away the affliction, the pain. What did Hannah say at 1 Samuel 1.11? to look on her affliction, see, to take away the reproach, to take away the affliction. So this all matches up very nicely. There is no doubt when we look at 1 Samuel chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 30, the reason why Rachel never got the child to begin with is because it's the same thing in Hannah's case. One is because one wife was favored above the other. So God wanted to make sure that the other wife who was despised was more blessed. Okay, but that's not fair to the other side. Well, you got to understand this. Nothing in life is fair. So what you women should do is you should simply pray. Rather than just whining about and complaining about unfairness. But that's the majority of us unsaved, belief, uh, unsaved people right now. They'd sooner lose their souls and be damned in the burning hell and complain about how unfair God is rather than at least give a prayer to him. That's one thing you have to learn about life, okay? So notice in this case right here that Rachel, she never prayed to begin with. So because she prayed, God finally heard her and then gave birth, uh, was, was able to grant her a child. But another thing is this in verse 24. And she called his name Joseph so, and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. So Rachel calls the baby's name Joseph. And then she responds, God's going to give me another child. If you look at 1 Samuel chapter 2 and then verse, uh, let's see right here. If you look at 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 21, you know what God did to Hannah? Gave her more children after that. This, there's no doubt. This is matching with Hannah's case. This is matching with Hannah's case. So if you go back to Genesis chapter 30, Rachel knew that God would give her another son. So God is good. God is good to Rachel if only she would pray and ask. If only she would humble herself. But that is her problem. And there is no doubt about this. Rachel, she was too comfortable as an independent feminist. All right, you women need to hear this, okay? We, uh, you women are so comfortable in this day and age being in, I know you're independent, I know you're strong, and sometimes your husband can be a lot weaker than you, which is a shame nowadays. But that does not give you uh, the leeway to put so much faith in your independence rather than on the Lord. And God will humble you really fast, and he will. That was Rachel's problem. So Rachel's son, Joseph, right here, it means, interestingly, uh, take away or add. Take away or add. So take away the reproach or add another child. But it could mean something else, which I'll tell you later on. Onyx stone would match up. We don't know the apostle or disciple. Gentile month could be December, or the Jewish month could be January to February, if y'all can see that. Let's look at the gleanings with Rachel here that you women need to learn, all right? Now, let's see if you match with her problem here. Number one, if you recall, at Genesis chapter 29, Leah, she's already uh, humbled herself. Why? Because in Genesis chapter 29, you might recall that at verse, uh, let's see right here, 
Verse 17, Genesis 29, 17. Lender was tender to the eyes. She, so see, she's timid. She's tender already. But Rachel, in contrast, not tender, well favored by people. Also very beautiful. If you women are like that, what's the tendency? That pride. She has too much pride in her. Women who are pretty vain speaks a lot about their ego. To, their ego. It's getting quiet here, so, uh, but I know I'm speaking what's, uh, what's true, so I have to keep on going, okay? That's, uh, so you have to watch out for that, ladies. You have to watch out for that. And if you get favoritism by people, you get too comfortable with that. You think whatever you're doing then is right. And no one can tell you what to do. Not even your husband, even though the Bible demands that. See, you got to watch out for that. Chapter 30, chapter 30, notice right here, God is the one responsible in verse 2, shutting up the womb. Look, God wouldn't do that without good reason. And it's not just women, everybody, man, woman, child, can admit this. When God sends a trial or an affliction on your life, it is either because there's, uh, of your sin or God's refining you. But both things come down to one point. There's something wrong with you you need to clean up. Right. Doesn't change that fact. So she needs to be humble. There's no doubt about that. If God shuts up, shuts up the womb and then be, her pride is from her beauty. And then the book of Proverbs warns about that about beauty and uh, vain women. But the one that's more favored by the Lord is the one whose spirit is clean. If you also look at, uh, look at another thing. In verse 2 to 3, this is very interesting. How Rachel responds to God sending affliction is in verse 3, okay, God, will you take it, take it away from me? Okay, God, I humble myself. Okay, God, will you look upon my grief? No, her plan, verse 3. Go to Bilhah. She goes by her plan, her decision. Usually independent women are that way. First default is whenever something, uh, an affliction happens, the female instinct kicks in and then they do their own thing rather than... Am I right? You women got to resort to prayer as a first instinct, not, okay, then do this. But that's the female instinct is to do things their own way, especially if they lived all their years so used to their own ways of doing things. And it's always worked for them. So her plans. Now notice that this matches with Sarah. So consequences come out. And you women know this to be true, is that when you go by your plans, now I'm, I'm not trying to say that I know women, but I do know this, this does work, this does happen when I look at individuals' life or even my own life, okay? So that's the reason why I'll, you know, if I say you women, don't think of it as, well, what do you know about women? It's not more so of what I know about women. It's more so I know about human nature, okay? But because I'm preaching at you women, I just have to do that, okay? If God tells me to preach against a certain ad uh, address or an audience, I have to speak specifically to that audience, okay? So here's the thing, is that consequences happen from your plans, Sarah, Sarah did the same thing. I cannot give a child, so you sleep with my handmaiden, Hagar. What was the result? The consequence was, got the wrong child. And then now it comes in conflict with the Arab nation and Jews today. That would have never have happened if Sarah didn't resort to her plan. Same thing with Rachel. The consequence was, she could have given birth to the tr tribe or the line of the Antichrist. Dan. I mean, read verse uh, 
four, five, six. Don't look at me like a tree full of owls, okay? Look at three, four, five, six. Didn't Dan come out? That's the first child that came out from that decision. Consequences. All right, another thing right here. Verse 8. See, wrestlings have I prevailed. Women are competitive creatures at times and jealous of other women. They refuse to be humbled. They refuse to see theirs. And if there's someone better than her, especially someone, an adversary or someone that they see, they let that spirit eat them up and then they go in a battle mode. And you're way far away from humility. God, I need your help. Not my way, but thine be done. Now, what happens uh, worse than this? So then she's saying, I won, I won, I won. Now, this is worse too. Look at verse 6 and look at verse 8. They have so much confidence in their own ways of doing things. They, no matter how long God shuts up Rachel's womb, she still didn't get humble. She has so much confidence in her ways because she's so used to being beautiful, favored by people. So because of that, no, no, I, I, what I'm doing is right. God heard my voice. That's why she said that. But that's the same mistake Eve made. I've gotten a man from the Lord. That she mentioned about Cain. And that's why you get these uh, female preachers like Joyce Meyer and then Paula White and then, you know, Victoria Osteen. I bet you she runs the church, not her husband, okay? <laughs> but these women who have so much confidence and female power, you know, and then contributing to the movement of feminism and, you know, God hears us. God is for this. God is not. God is not. And that makes it worse if you put God into it. Don't you dare put God into it, ladies. Now, that's the danger of your independence uh, or your use to, of doing things. You will always think you're right, and you will even see God in a pattern. That is dangerous. Continuing on right here, let's see. Notice verse 15. She relies on the ways of the world. Worldly ideas, worldly pagan ways. You women rely on worldly ways as a good idea. Notice the mandrakes, right? That was the way of the world. If you want to be fertile, follow along what we do. Get a mandrake. It's valuable. But that's just paganism that time. But that's what the world tells you women. Follow the science. Follow the world's way of doing things. Follow these female scholars, what they've said. And then they give these stories, you know, the, these women or the lesbians, LGBTQ, talking about female power or this kind of garbage and saying, look at my life. I'm so happy. I'm so prosperous. They're lying through their teeth, man. They're lying through their teeth. Give you the worldly ways of doing things. Here's another one right here. And then... If you look at verse 22, finally, she prays. Now, if there's one thing you women need to know is this, is that notice how very simple this is. But you women are very complex creatures, okay? And when I say you women, I can include myself too and humans in general. But uh, if I'm hitting the nail on the head then to the audience, and I'm going to stick to that audience, you women, Notice this. You see this? How, how complex is this? Just how long will it take for you to do this? How long will it take for you to humble yourself? Say, God, I am in the wrong. God, I see that I need you. God, I see that my way is not the, the best way of doing things. I surrender to you. What's going to take for you to surrender, Rachel? Now, there's a lot of gleanings from Rachel. The last thing I want to con conclude is verse 24. This is very good in verse 24. 24, like I told you, Joseph's name could mean take away because of the reproach or add, meaning adding another child, according to the definition of verse 
23 and 24. But isn't it a coincidence? Give and take away. Job, what did he say when he went through affliction? When God really put him through the fire? The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This speaks volumes about Rachel. She says, it could be, Rachel's like, I surrender all. If I have a child, I have it. If not, it's yours, Lord. Whew. She got humbled. Now, God forbid some of you women are going through that path with Rachel right now. If I were you, this is, this is a miserable life. If I were you, I'd stop that right now and do this. It's the best way. Always the best way. As a matter of fact, God's blessing will exceed your own desire, your own way of doing things. In Rachel's case, she's got the greatest son ever. That's the greatest typology of Jesus Christ ever in the entire Bible. Joseph, what a huge blessing and honor. All right, verse 25. Oh, I want to talk about this, the rods and the sheep. Let's see how much I can cover. I have 10 minutes. And it came to pass when Rachel had borne Joseph that Jacob said unto Laban, send me away that I may go unto my own place and to my country. So it just so happened to be that when J Rachel gave birth to Joseph, Jacob says to Laban, hey, uh, send me away, okay? I'm sick and tired of staying with you. Let me go back to my own place, my own country, my own people, because he missed them. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served thee and let me go. Jacob says, hey, uh, give me my wives, my children, so don't keep them anymore with you. I served you enough. So remember, he served Laban so that he can in, uh, gain the wives from him. He says, let me go, for thou knowest my service which I have done thee. Because you know how well I served you, what I did for you. It's very good. And Laban said unto, them, I, uh, said unto him, I pray thee, if I have found favor in thine eyes, tarry, for I have learned by experience that the Lord hath blessed me for thy sake. Laban says to Jacob, hey, I'm begging you, if, you know, you found favor with me in your sight, stay here longer. From my experience, I've seen and learned that God blesses you, uh, God blesses me because of you. So that's why Laban wants to keep him. Verse 28, and he said, appoint me thy wages and I will give it. So Laban says, hey, you pick and you make the selection on how I'm going to pay you and I'll be sure to give it to you. And he said unto him, thou knowest how I have served thee and how thy cattle was with me. For it was little which thou hadst before I came and it is now increased unto a multitude and the Lord hath blessed thee since my coming. And now when shall I provide for mine own house also? Okay, look how I explain every word now, okay? Basically, Jacob says to Laban, you very well know how well I served you and how your cattle was with me, how I served you with them. The cattle uh, numbers was very little when, before I came to you, but now the, the number of cattle increased to a great number to a great multitude. Lord, the Lord really blessed you ever since I came to you. But when will I provide for my own house, okay? I keep providing for your house, what about me? And he said, what shall I give thee? And Jacob said, thou shall not give me anything. If thou wilt do this thing for me, I will again feed and keep thy flock. Laban says, what will I give you? All right. So he just ignores it and just insists, what will I give you? And Jacob, the sly rascal, all right, comes up with a very clever deal. Okay. He says, oh, you don't have to give me anything at all. Just do this one thing for me and I will feed and your flock and tend and take care of them. Okay. I will pass through all thy flock today, removing from thence all the speckled and spotted cattle and all the brown cattle among the sheep and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and of such shall be my hire. Okay, now pay attention to this part. This is where we begin Jacob's sheep. And I'm going to try to fit all this in eight minutes, okay? So the idea is this. Jacob said, I'm going to go through your flock, okay? 
So flock is synonymous with cattle. In Webster's 1828 dictionary, cattle can refer to sheep, believe it or not. So remember that. So flock and cattle can be interchangeable. When I pass through your flock, I'm going to remove from your flock, from there, that's what the idea from thence is, any, uh, any cattle that's what? Speckled, spotted, or brown. You, usually, the, the pure or solid colors are more favored. They're more favored livestock. So Jacob's saying, I'm going to take also the spotted speckled among your goats as well. Not just the sheep, but the goats. And they will be my hire. They're going to be my pay. Okay? Those will belong to me. So shall my righteousness answer for me in time to come. <laughs> his righteousness. His honesty. No, he's a sleaze, man. He's a sneak. When it shall come for my hire before thy face, every one that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and brown among the sheep, that shall be counted stolen with me. Okay, look how I explain every word, okay? Jacob's saying, so my integrity, see that? My honesty is, uh, is going to be shown. I'm going to answer for it. I'll be honest with you, and I'm going to answer for it. When that time comes, when there are speckled, spotted uh, among the goats that are not, or brown that are not among the sheep, those will be counted as stolen property with me. Uh, when it shall come for my hire before thy face. So in other words, that uh, my integrity is going to speak for me in the time to come when I get my hire in your presence, but then within my hire, within my pay, you're going to spot what? Those that are not speckled or spotted or brown, I'll count that as stolen property with you, okay? So I hope you understood every single word from that and that matched the interpretation. All right, verse 34. And Laban said, Behold, I would it might be according to thy word. And he removed that day the he goats that were ring straight and spotted and all the she goats that were speckled and spotted and every one that had some white in it and all the brown among the sheep and gave them into the hand of his son. So Laban says, Look, okay, uh, I'm going to Go according to what you say. So he removes from that day any male or female goats that were, you know, speckle spotted, ring strength, whatnot, brown. And then he's going to, and he gave them to the hand of his son. So Laban's sons kept it. All right, now we're going to, I am going to erase this part. Thank God this is all blank, otherwise I wouldn't have any room. And then I'm going to draw it out so you can understand this interpretation. This has been the standard passage used by atheists to prove that it's not unscientific. But believe it or not, this is very scientific, and this is commonly practiced even today, except the rod part, okay? But the rod part, some of it is practiced today. So I'll explain how it works, okay? So Laban's son keeps the basically uh, the spotted or brown, right? Okay, that's fine. Spotted or brown. So Laban's son, remember the spotted and brown that La that's among Laban's flock were given to his sons now. If they're given to his sons, his sons are holding it for Jacob. That's Jacob's hire. That belongs to Jacob. Okay, why is that? Because if these guys mingled with the solid colors, what could happen? Then it could increase the numbers more for Jacob if they turn out spotted or brown, right? Now, here's the thing is that um, I could be wrong about this, but from breeding with the animals, solid colors are more common than spotted or brown. So if, the, if solid colors, the sheep, were to mingle together, there are times from the recessive gene, uh, spotted or brown can come out. But the dominant gene, okay, the more common, basically the more common that would be born is solid colors, okay? But chances would increase more for spotted or brown if a solid color, color mingled with the spotted color, obviously, right? So chances would increase. However, even though chances increase, it's still very small. Okay? 
Usually solid colors come out more even if they mingled with spotted, believe it or not. Okay? So that is, to my knowledge, a breeding. But here's something very... So Jacob is extremely clever. This guy, if you're talking about a Jew that's very clever, Jacob is the greatest evidence of that. So Laban's seen no danger to this. My flock would outnumber Jacob no matter what. And he even had his sons hold him, the spotted and brown, to make sure the chances uh, don't grow for Jacob where his spotted and brown cattle could, could increase. Okay? Remember, the one who has the bigger cattle is the more rich person during that time, obviously, right? Laban's going to be more rich if more of them are solid colors, and Jacob would be the poorer person if he had fewer spotted or cattle. Because remember, Jacob said, spotted or cattle are my pay grade. The solid colors are yours, Laban. Do we follow so far, or is anyone lost? Okay. Now, I'm trying to do this with two more minutes left, or <laughs> I'm over the time, okay? So, so look how this works, okay? Jacob is extremely clever, okay? So Jacob should have zero chances, basically, okay? To have a, a better flock than Laban or an increase. Verse 36, and he set three days journey betwixt himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. So Laban, he put a three days journey's distance between himself and Jacob, and Jacob, notice, fed the rest of Laban's flock. So Jacob did not take care of spotted or brown. Laban's son is holding them. Remember that. Jacob is taking care of the rest of the flock. The remaining flock should be solid color. Do we follow so far? Okay. All right. So Jacob's taking care, uh, caring for s solid color. Okay. For s a solid color. And that's Laban's. Okay. Now, remember, look at this. Jacob is extremely clever. 37. And Jacob took him rods of green poplar and of the hazel and chestnut tree and pilled white strakes in them and made the white appear which was in the rods. Okay, basically Jacob finds rods that are from the poplar tree. Also hazel and chestnut. Three different types. Okay, not just one. This guy is so clever. Pilled is a, in Webster's 1828 dictionary, could also mean peel, okay? Strakes can also mean those uh, streaks or, you know, those lines. And so he makes sure, look at the interpretation, verse 37. He makes sure that the white appears, okay? Because obviously, when you peel off the bark, the white can come out, right? Creation scientists have disproved the atheist and shown there is fertile medicinal purposes to this. There's also, it gives strength as well. It gives strength. It does something to the urinary or the gastrointestinal system. It also increases fertility with the poplar tree. Hazel chestnut, we've yet to see, but I bet you it has some sort of, uh, if not fertile, at least medicinal purposes. Okay? This was practiced even in Jacob's region, believe it or not. There are some people who've done that, and you lambs, they actually eat the whole uh, rod or twig or the bark itself sometimes. But if you soak it in water, it's even more so. The chances increase if you soak it in water. So look what Jacob did. Verse 38, And he set the rods which he had pilled before the flocks in the gutters in the watering troughs when the flocks came to drink. Jacob, so this is all scientifically proven. Jacob, he put those rods uh, that he uh, peeled in front of the presence of the sheep in the gutters, in the watering troughs, when the flocks would drink it up, that they should conceive when they came to drink. So if they eat that up or drink it up, then they will be able to have chances of more fertility. Verse 39, and the flocks conceived before the rods. This is the passage that's supposed to be controversial. So the sheep supposedly were able to conceive uh, baby lambs while they were drinking uh, or eating at the presence of the rods. They became pregnant. And then they gave birth to uh, cattle 
uh, babies that were ring streaked, speckled, and spotted, which is Jacob's hire. That's what Jacob wants, right? The more that those uh, sheep or cattle give birth to ring streaked, speckled, and spotted, then what? Jacob's hire increases more than Laban's, right? But this is the problem. Atheists have used this to say, oh, well, what that means is when the sheep saw that, then supposedly, magically, they gave birth to uh, children that were ring straight spotted, not solid colors. That's not possible. So they're not using their heads right here. That's not what it means, okay? One is, like I told you, it's for fertility purposes, medicinal purposes, okay? Jacob is extremely clever. Look what he did, okay? So they're supposed to become fertile when they drink this. Now, these are solid color, remember, not spotted brown, okay? So how in the world can solid co color give birth to spotted and brown, right? Remember, one is this. It's possible they can because that's a recessive gene. So if you're going to be a smart guy... How are you going to get spotted and brown coming out? They need to give birth to a lot of babies. So if they drink up that watering trow and the chances of fertility increase, sure, you might have a lot of solid colors, but there's bound to be ring straight and spotted. Okay, but, but Jacob is so clever. That's not done, okay? He's not done yet. He's got to make sure that the ring straight spotted outbreeds the solid color, right? Look at this. The scripture already explained to you. It explained to you, okay? Verse 40, and Jacob did what? Separate the lambs. Verse 39 did not say the flocks gave birth only to sheep, ring strake, speckled, and spotted. It simply said when they were eating from the rods, they were able to give birth to ring straight and spotted. That don't mean they net that they that doesn't mean they only gave birth to spotted. It simply means they were able to give birth to ring straight spotted. So what does that mean? Because verse 40, why did Jacob separate the lambs then? And then set the faces of the flock toward the ring straight and all the brown in the flock of Laban. What does that mean? That means that when the solid colors we're eating from that trout, they became more fertile, okay? And when they became more fertile, it's one, because of what those uh, peeled barks did, or two, somehow he was able to get, uh, well, uh, forget that, okay? Let's just come back to this point, all right? We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna go way off right here. So the idea is, when they become more fertile, they give more birth, right? So when they give more birth after drinking from that, then they were able, verse 39, able to give birth to speckled and spotted. So once the solid color were able to give birth to spotted and brown, now he has spotted and brown being born, as well as solid colors, right? Now this is basic for any person who are shepherds. And Jacob, remember, his family were shepherds. So he knows the trade. If he wants a specific breed of sheep, you have to make sure that you separate them and make sure that one side is called out and the others keep breeding with each other. So what he did was he separated, verse 40, the, the spotted from the solid colors and set the faces of the flock. He made sure that the face of all of Laban's flock paid attention toward who? The ring straight and all the brown in the flock of Laban. He made sure that, hey, all of Laban's flock, they're going to pay attention to only spotted and brown now. Now what happens? The recessive gene shrinks a little bit more, and then pretty soon dominant gene can take its place a bit more and more and more. Why? As time passes by, Solid will mingle with spotted, and then it'll still come out solid. Chances are still high. But all Jacob has to do is just weed it out. And then the solid colors, make sure you don't interbreed. Bad sheep, get out of there. And then he makes sure that the spotted keep mingling. In time, especially with, with years, patient years, you're going to win. Look at this. 
Verse 40, and he put his own flocks by themselves and put them not unto Laban's cattle. See, that's proof. He made sure that his own flocks, spotted and brown, don't mingle with the solid color. He said, you're going to stay by yourself and keep increasing. Because like I told you before, if they mingle with solid, then the dominant gene is solid. Okay? So he's going to make sure that they stay by themselves, but the solid is going to shrink how? They don't interbreed. And they're going to mingle with the other spotted and brown. Okay? So he makes, this guy is so clever, man. He's such a genius. All right, uh, verse 41. And it came to pass whensoever the stronger cattle did conceive. This is the key. This is evidence that he did this tactic. So it just so happened whenever the stronger cattle were able to give birth, Jacob laid the rods before the eyes in the gutters that they might conceive among the rods. Jacob made sure that the rods where they become more fertile, are in front of the eyes of stronger cattle so that they can give birth. Now, obviously, who does he want to give birth to be stronger? The ring strike spotted or solid colors? Ring strike spotted. So he keeps giving it to them. And then look at verse 42. But when the cattle were feeble, he put them not in. So obviously, who does he want the cattle to be feeble? The solid. So he's not going to put those uh, fertile, uh, ro uh, the rods where you can become more fertile for the solid colors. He made sure that they don't have that. So the feebler were Laban's. So then feebler cattle belonged to Laban, the ones that didn't have more fertility. And the stronger Jacob's. Jacob had the stronger cattle that were more strong, more fertile. As a matter of fact, Sheep or the flock tend to favor more on stronger females. Or I think females prefer stronger males, either or. But the point is fertility grows if the animal is more strong. And Jacob made sure that his spottled and ring straight were very strong so that, oh, that way these sheep can choose, hey, I want the spotted side because they're stronger. Let's mate and then increase the seed more. Okay, verse, four, uh, verse 43, uh, we'll, we'll continue that later. So I am 10 minutes off. That wasn't bad <laughs> for doing all of that. Okay, did you understand that interpretation? Okay, that was, this is, a, this is one of the hardest interpretations in the Bible and so-called controversies in your King James Bible. But actually just literally reading word for word, line upon line and going by that exact sequence, you already get the answer. It's more simple than you think, believe it or not. It's more simple. Jacob, remember, he was a shepherd. So he knew all the brilliant tactics on how to make cattle more fertile and how his can outnumber Laban's. This is a very clever guy. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Uh, Father God, I pray that today's teaching have been a blessing to the hearers and bless the next service we're about to have. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.